take our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the words that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. So as I read this, I was focusing just totally on the wrong bit. <laughs> and I wrote loads on it and um, had to start again. Um, and it's the reason why I've said to you guys, please do watch Mike's sermon from last week, because I'm going to cover it very short, very shortly. Um, but basically, there's three parts to this sermon. The first part is the condition. The second part is the gift. And then the majority of our time, we'll look into part three, which is the person. So very briefly, the condition. In my Bible, the title says, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. But if you were listening to what I just read, you'll notice that the promise is conditional. So let's have a look at the condition. He says... If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So the condition is loving Jesus, which means obeying his commandments. So if you remember, if you saw last week, Mike said that if you're born again, your life will display a change. This is the change Jesus is talking about. You will love the Lord, and that love means that you will obey his commandments. It's not that that's how you're saved, although repentance is a good start, but it's what happens as a consequence of being saved. Once you know him and love him, he will work in you to help you to obey. It's clearly very important because Jesus mentions it no less than five times in our passage alone. Verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Verse 24, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Then he goes on and he shows he's not one of those teachers who's a do as I say, not as I do teacher, because he says, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And what he's talking about here is he's going to go to the cross, the ultimate act of love and obedience. But I just want to emphasize something. A born-again Christian is changed, not perfect. And the reason I say it is because I think it was a wall I put up inadvertently for years, thinking I couldn't receive the Holy Spirit because I wasn't good enough. But hear this. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version because I just think the words just enrich it. It's from Philippians 2. and It says this, For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. The very words born from above show us it's God who enables the change. Part two, the gift. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, 
and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is a gift himself. Today we're not focusing on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're focusing on the gift of the Holy Spirit. He himself is a gift. So I just want you to imagine this. A gift randomly turns up on my doorstep and it's nicely wrapped, but there's no card. How am I feeling? I'm probably a bit excited and a little bit suspicious, to be honest. What might be inside? So I open it up and inside it's edible. Homemade cookies and they smell lovely. But hang on, I don't know who they're from. Would I eat them? I mean, you know me, I probably would. <laughs> but what if there was something nasty in them? What if the person didn't wash their hands? Or what if they were Parmesan flavoured? <laughs> I hate cheese. I know, it's weird, I hate cheese. But just now imagine, I check on my phone, and there's a WhatsApp. I've left you a little treat on your doorstep. Love, Judith. Now, if you've ever had Judith's cookies, you know what happens next. Devoured. <laughs> My point is this. When you know the giver of the gift, you can trust the gift. Because our passage tells us who the gift is from. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Do you know the givers? It's Jesus. You've trusted him with your eternity so you can trust his gift. And we sang earlier, didn't we? Good, good father. When you know the giver of the gift, you can trust the gift. And our passage, it not only tells us about the giver of the gift, it tells us the nature of the gift. Jesus says, another helper He's saying, another one, just like me. When you know the giver of the gift, you can trust the gift. In Luke 11, it says this, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's a good gift. So let's just go back to my imaginary doorstep. How do I get the gift. Well, I pick it up, I take it in, I receive it. I don't look at the gift, close the door, go back inside, read my Bible the whole way through, help tilt ten grannies across the road, pray every prayer I know twice, then receive the gift. I simply receive the gift. I feel like the Lord wants you to know today, don't close the door on the gift. If you are a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit is yours. And it was a bad analogy because it's not just on your doorstep. Our passage says the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But it says you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, Jesus said that to his disciples before Pentecost, but we are his disciples if you follow him after Pentecost. If you are a born-again believer, if you've accepted what Christ did for you on the cross and repented and turned from your sin, the Holy Spirit lives in you. I think my favorite thing about this passage, and for me, the best part of the gift, is you get to keep him forever. Unlike Judith's cookies, although they do say a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. But the thing is, 
Loneliness is endemic. And this gift means you never have to be lonely ever again. I was just saying to my friends who came round for dinner, that I so often say, oh, we are going there, when really it's just me. But I constantly feel like I'm with the Lord. I constantly, wherever I go, he's with me. This gift, this promised gift, he is with me. I think I've always imagined being one of Jesus' disciples when he walked the earth. I don't know about you, but I've always imagined what it would be like. And yes, I would probably would be Peter with the foot and mouth disease. But how wonderful it would have been to be with Jesus, our Emmanuel, our God with us, to have walked places with him to have talked with him, to have laughed with him, to have enjoyed meals with him, with God in the flesh, to have witnessed his preaching firsthand, to see people healed and raised from the dead, to have had him there in those storms, and to have relied on his miraculous provision again and again. And then imagine him announcing his leaving. Emmanuel, no more. The fear of doing it all alone. And that's when Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus says about this promise. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. As I say those words, will be loved, I don't know if you know that. Is it Maroon 5's song? You will be loved. You will. I don't want to give you my singing. (laughs) You will be loved. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a promise for us. What sort of gift could fulfill this promise? A power? A force? A picture in a frame? Father God and Jesus, his son, will love you, will come to you, and will make their home with you. Only a person can fulfill this. Only a person can love you. Only a person can come to you. Only a person can make their home with you. Welcome the person of the Holy Spirit. When a service leader says, come Holy Spirit, I just wonder, what do you imagine happening? I asked a couple of friends when I was preparing, and some of us imagined something coming down from heaven, or if I'm honest, I kind of imagine something coming down from the ceiling. Maybe that's a bit like the tongues of fire in the upper room. One of us was imagining a wind blowing within us, maybe like Pentecost again. Another thought of something rising up from within them. And then... What about if you pray for someone, be filled with the Holy Spirit? What do you imagine then? Do you you imagine something being poured in, like living water? Or sometimes I think I imagine something expanding inside, like a balloon. I'm not asking us to biblically analyse each one of those things, or whether they're right or wrong. But my point is, is that none of them sound very much like a person, do they? And I'm just wondering, how often do we forget that the Holy Spirit is a person. So often, 
during worship, we seek after an experience or a feeling, or we might seek after a spiritual gift and fail to remember the person. If you feel the Holy Spirit during a time of worship, is it relational or is it experiential? Are you wanting something or someone? A point I think I'm trying to make is, you've heard it probably a hundred times in basic teaching. He's a he, not an it. He's a person, not a force. We hear it over and over again that he's a person. But how deeply do we believe this? How does it correspond with our thoughts and our expectations and our experiences? Because Jesus is absolutely certain and absolutely clear on it. He calls him he throughout. He is always referred to as a person. And a person is defined as having intelligence, a will, and emotions. And we're going to um, explore all three of those in relation to the Holy Spirit in a minute. But I just want to ask you personally, have you ever really considered his personhood deeply? And if you have, how well do you know him? My prayer for each one of you today I don't want to speak on another's behalf, but I think his prayer for you today too is that you will fully realize who the Holy Spirit is, the person of him. That you will take down any barriers that you might have put up between you, because I tell you they're from your side. That you will stop holding this person at arm's length how painful it is to be held at arm's length from someone who you love. And that you will come into deep and rich relationship with him. Do you realize that is his deep desire? The Holy Spirit wants to be in a deep relationship with you. Part of being in any deep relationship is learning to trust. I pray you will learn to trust him fully because he is worthy of your trust. My final prayer is that in response to that, you would fully yield to him. Can you picture us as a church fully yielded? to the Holy Spirit. I can almost hear someone thinking there, but what about the word? The Holy Spirit wrote the word. All scripture is God breathed. And who is the breath of God? The Holy Spirit wrote it. You've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. They don't have separate agendas. They don't have different plans or different ways of doing things. They are wholly united. And if you love the word, do you love its author? It's not spirit versus word. You can't truly have one without the other. So how do you find out more about an author? You read his book. And his book talks about him from beginning to end. From when he hovered over the waters of the earth in Genesis to when he and the bride, the church, say come right at the end of Revelation. Because he is a wonderful person. And he is yours to be with you forever. He's a gift He's so wonderful that Jesus said it was to our advantage that Jesus went away because the Holy Spirit would be able to come. I just sense how deeply he wants you to know him today. Let's look first in our passage. Jesus calls him helper. In your version of the Bible, it might say comforter or counselor 
or advocate. You probably have heard the Greek word before, parakletos or paraklete. And it means one who is called alongside. One who is with you. One to encourage you, to help you, to guide you. But the word helper can seem inferior, can't it? But the way it was used back then when it was written was like a barrister coming to your aid in a courtroom. And it's just an example of where translating into the English language can bring connotations to something that aren't really there. But then, if you think of the Holy Spirit solely as a barrister, you're going to miss out on that closeness and that love and care of the relationship. Helper, comforter, counsellor, advocate. Having those different translations helps us to understand more fully who he is. Jesus also calls him the spirit of truth and later says he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So thinking of those three elements of personality, here we have intelligence. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10 to 12 says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. The Holy Spirit, he knows and understands the depths of God. Do you realize he desires to explain them to you? Have you asked him? Secondly and briefly, that second element of personality, the will. The Holy Spirit is shown to have a will. When Paul writes about spiritual gifts, he says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. But don't forget, the Holy Spirit's will is in accord with the will of the Father and of the Son. You don't need to be scared of what he wants to do. And the third thing, emotions. You've probably heard that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Paul warns us in Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now the word grieve means to make someone sorrowful. Not annoyed or angry, but sad, distressed and sorrowful. And I say that because for some reason I've always confused it with the word aggrieved which is to be resentful at being unfairly treated. That's not the word. It's sadness and sorrow. You can make him sad. You can make him grieve. You can make him sorrowful. On the flip side, the Holy Spirit loves us. He loves you. I think I always think of God the Father as loving me and God the Son as loving me. He died on the cross for me. The Holy Spirit, he loves you. When I was preparing this, the the name of the Holy Spirit as helper, that parakletos, the one called alongside, it just gave me this revelation of his love, this picture of him who comes alongside you in love. He wants to draw you into his arms because he loves you. I just want you to meditate on that for a moment. When someone says, come Holy Spirit, when someone says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, he's the one who draws alongside you and loves you. And love draw, it drives out fear. Love crosses divides. So receive him. Receive his love. Him as a person, Jesus is described as being meek. And that is 
a power under control. And I think that's who the Holy Spirit is. He's meek. He's a power under control. He wants to draw alongside you. He wants to have relationship with you. The final thing I want to concentrate on, because there is so much I could say about him, but we've got a whole series. Something I see happen to so many people when they meet with the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you the number of times I've prayed with someone, and when I ask them, did anything happen? How do you feel? They reply to me, peace. I've probably told you the story before of when I was on holiday in Greece and I was talking to an atheist and I asked her if I could pray with her and she said yes, which is strange for an atheist. And um, as I prayed for her and laid on hands, she experienced this incredible peace that was just beyond her understanding, a peace that transformed her from being an atheist. Jesus says toward the end of our passage that he leaves something else with us. His peace. He says this Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So, how do you think he gives you his peace? By his Holy Spirit. And that word peace, let me expand it. At oneness. Rest, quietness, tranquility, harmony, security, safety, the state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God, content with its earthly lot. It's what the whole of humanity is searching for. And you, if you have believed, If you have been and are being changed, you've been given this gift, this person to be with you forever, who brings a multitude of benefits with him. Will you receive him fully today? Will you trust him? Will you love him? Will you yield to him? I want us to respond to him, to have a chance to respond to him today. As I was preparing for this response, I thought of some different things, different ways in which you may feel you need to respond having heard what I've said One might be that you recognize there's a barrier, you might feel that there's a barrier between you and the Holy Spirit, or that you know you've kept him at arm's length, you've feared what he might do, feared being made a fool of. And I want you to, today, to consider taking down those barriers, to bring in that arm and let him come. Maybe you want to have a deeper realisation of him as a person. I think we all need that. Or maybe today you really want to accept him, to love him, to trust him, and to yield to him. So I'm going to ask the wonderful technical team at the back to play us a song. And it's just a quiet song. But I want to give you an opportunity during this song to really reflect and invite him. Remember what I said about his meekness. He wants you to ask. And there will be people available to pray with you. If you feel like you want to respond to anything, you want to respond to his personhood, you want to break down those barriers, you want to build your trust, please feel free to come over here and someone will pray with you. If the prayer team wants to come and get ready, that would be really, really wonderful, please. If you wouldn't mind playing, please, thank you.
Holy Spirit. It's not often that I pray to you. Sometimes I feel like Jesus directed us to pray to the Father. Sometimes I ignore you as a person. And I know how you just want to glorify Jesus and the Father. And I want to know you better. I want to remember at every point that you are a person who loves me, who is with me forever. And Lord, wherever any one of us has put up barriers, Holy Spirit, where we're holding you at arm's length, due to fear or not feeling good enough. I pray you'd help us to take those down and invite you in fully. As part of that, teach us to trust you. Help us to know you. Come and fill our lives us and help us to yield to you Holy Spirit I ask it all in Jesus name Amen if you're still spending time with